Good morning, everyone. And I saw a show of hands. Every, you pretty much were all here last night, correct? Um, so you saw the fabulous uh, stand-up conversation by Ilva, uh, which I think was a great example of using your needs to create paths for others coming forward um, in, in, a, in a corporate environment and in a government environment in your case. So thank you so much for that personal moment. It was really powerful. Um, we, there's a lot to talk about because Ilva's at the center of really this refugee crisis that's been uh, plaguing the world. Uh, but I first wanted to start, continue on that personal note because one thing you may not know about Ilva is that she's a math and physics person. Can you talk a little bit about how you, that, that role of math and physics in your life and how you became a government minister? Well, um, I, I decided I wanted to be a teacher in math and physics because when I went to school, um, those pupils who had was struggling with math, they felt like they are stupid. Hmm. And I was struggling with French. Ah. <laughs> and everybody said, she's lazy, you know. And I think that all, every children uh, has the right to feel the joy of math yeah. and the joy of being capable of manage math. So that's why I decided to be a, a math teacher. And I, I love that profession. And I think that's, uh, that's very much similar to what I've been doing also in, in the government as a Minister for Education, Minister for, for Health and Elderly Care, and now Minister for uh, Employment. It's very much about how helping people to, to develop themselves, to, to encourage people, to empowering people to be able to do the best of, of their lives. And you've had to transfer that to outsiders, that sensibility, that desire to help people. And you know, Sweden, of course, is known as the most generous country in the world. Uh, just to give you, to remind you all of Sweden's role in taking in refugees, in 2015, 160,000 refugees came into Sweden. Uh, at, at some points, it was 10,000 a week. Yeah. Uh, 2% of your population is refugee. Now, if you took that number and you applied it to the United States, that would mean we would take in 6 million refugees. I don't think we're anywhere near that now. Uh, but it begs the question, is your generosity being pushed? Is your generosity being tested? Are people in Sweden saying enough is enough? No, they are not saying enough is enough. We, we do this uh, public service in, in the European Union, and Sweden is still the country who is most positive towards uh, uh, taking new immigrants from outside the European Union, Union. Almost the most positive taking people from the Union. 93% <laughs> says we should help refugees. So there is still a very strong support for being a uh, a country that will stand up for solidarity and, and help people that are fleeing from, from hell, actually. But of course, the situation we had in 2015, that's not sustainable. Right. So that's why we also had to, to change. Now we are down to about 30,000 a year refugees. That's still uh, more than, I think, any other European <laughs> Union yes. country, according to population. Uh, but that's that's sustainable level, so that we can. Uh, and what what change did you make to bring it down to that level? Well, we made some uh, changes in the asylum um, regulation, right. uh, and also. Uh, well, let me, may I say something about the, this fall in 2015, where we had this enormous inflow of refugees coming to Europe. It wasn't actually so enormous, but about one million, one and a half million, something like that. If we had share, shared that uh, in a um, fair way between different countries, we could have managed that fine. But we didn't. And the feeling I had in Sweden up in north was like looking out on Europe and countries after country just disappeared from the map. Yeah. Uh, so we were only a few countries left. Like we were islands. Uh, taking uh, so we 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 find ourselves in situation with where we had uh, 
too big proportion of the uh, responsibility for Europe and that's why we think it's so important that we will have uh, a situation where we can share responsibilities better between European countries uh, because then Europe can stand up and take our share of helping people uh, in the situation with so many refugees in the world. But just in terms, like again, on the on the political backlash, there is a party. So you'd say about twenty percent of the population, and there's a party that that is anti-refugee, anti-immigrant, correct? Um, and when we see polls that say forty percent of Swedes are concerned about immigration, you and I were talking last night, and you corrected me, and you said, well, that includes people who are concerned that we're not keeping some refugees who yeah. are being deported. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, a lot of people have concerns about uh, immigration and if you talk to us Swedish people, it's the most important issue, it's immigration and integration, even more integration than immigration. But uh, we have about 20% that are anti. But the rest, uh, I can say a lot of people are concerned about when we now have this asylum process for all these 163,000, of course, most of them uh, got the permit to stay, but not all of them. Some has to go back. And there are, of course, demonstrations, a lot of people arguing, don't send them back, let's keep them here. Uh, they are so nice people, we wanted to keep them. So those are against sending people back, especially young people. Uh, sending back young people. Yeah. And also a lot of people are concerned about uh, how we can manage uh, uh, the real things. And, and that's, I, I agree, because we have huge challenges when it comes to housing. We are lacking housing all over the country. Uh, and we are uh, not perform performing good enough in schools. Uh, so we ha need to bid better school results and we are lacking skilled teachers. So we have a lot of these kind of concerns and, and they are, re are for real, actually. So. so it's, it's not only about immigration, but it's when we have these concerns, where should people live? How can we find uh, houses for them? Uh, how can we find teachers? How quick can we build new schools? Just, just an example, in the age 15 to 18, 10% of the 15 and 18 years old in Sweden came in 2015. Yeah. You understand the challenges in schools. And, and speak to this, you were talking to me at that table last night about viewing this as a mother. Talk about that. Yes, I've been thinking much about this. Uh, when in 2015, uh, 70,000 children and teenagers came to Sweden, half of them without their parents, 35,000 unaccompanied minors. Can you imagine? Mostly teenage boys. And I'm a mother of three plus three. So I gave birth to three and I'm stepmother for three. And my youngest child is a boy and he's 16 years old. His name is Anton. And I told you yesterday, he's, he's a wonderful person. I love him so much. But to be honest, he doesn't show that every day. <laughs> and would that be because he's a 16 year old boy? Yes. <laughs> and, and I can just imagine being a mother, have to say to your 16 year old boy, I can't protect you. You are not safe here. This is the basic thing for a parent, to protect your child. Imagine being in a situation, I can't protect you. We have to gather all resources we can get from families and relatives and whatever, send you away on a very, very dangerous journey. You might not even survive this journey. I might not ever see you again. Imagine doing that as a mother. And I've been thinking so much about that mother. <laughs> and what if I was the mother, I would think, I hope so much he will survive this journey. I will hope so much he will come to a good country, maybe Sweden. Uh, and I would hope so much that there will be somebody there who can see that he is a wonderful person, even if it doesn't show that every day. I mean, this is the responsibility. We can't be these uh, unaccompanied minors parents because they have parents uh, in another country. But we have to be instead of their parents as a society to help them, to uh, give them faith, to help them to uh, what are moral things and right and wrong and finding paths for the future and all that. Because they are, they are not grown up. They, they are very capable in many aspects, but not in all aspects. That's why they are minors. So this is the, this is a huge challenge. And, 
as with all teenagers, especially boys, as you say, it's, it's so important that we help them into the right track because we know there could be a lot of problems if we don't. Uh, that, that's for all young people. It's so important, uh, important years. So, and speaking of that, I mean, <coughs> the United States and other countries would look at these boys turning into young men and see one thing, security threat. Why don't you react like that? Well, of course, sometimes you have to, act, to react like that, but I think it's important to see that those who are teenagers from Afghanistan or, or Eritrea or Somalia, they are not different from my teenage boy. For example, I told you uh, a few weeks ago, my teenage boy, uh, he said, well, a mother and father, can you just go away for the weekend because I, I plan to have 10 uh, friends here over the weekend. <laughs> And we said, that's not a good idea. Not a good idea. <laughs> so, I mean, this is also the case. It's not a good idea if, whether they are born in Sweden or not to have 10 uh, teenage boys spending their time deciding by themselves with no, rel no parents and no grown-ups there. So, I mean, it's, it's the same kind of mechanism. Uh, we have to be there to help young people to find the right path in, in life and in society. I want to open this up to questions, so get your questions ready. Raise your hands while I ask this question. What have you learned about integrating this population, both what <coughs> mistakes have you made and what works? Well, I think uh, it's very important that the state uh, is acting. We haven't been doing that uh, enough before now. For example, now we have a law saying that all local communities has to take their share of newcomers. We didn't have that before. And that meant a lot of newcomers end up in poorer areas, where the richer areas didn't have any refugees coming. So now we are distributing refugees and more to the rich ones than to the poor ones. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important. The state has to act to help them and also to place them in areas where they're good, uh, a lot of jobs. So it's easier to find a job. And also to act like um, saying you have to go into this education, you have to go through this. To I think the state has to act in some aspect. I think that's one important thing. And the other important thing is the state is not enough. So we have to uh, include so, uh, civil society and they are making a tremendous job in Sweden. The civil society, they are just doing everything, <laughs> inviting newcomers to sports clubs and inviting uh, pregnant uh, newcomers mothers for uh, language courses and a lot of a lot of things are happening and I also invited the social partners the unions and employers to um, form fast tracks for newcomers into uh, their profession their branch and they said overwhelmingly yes so now they are forming these fast tracks, so we are picking people with the right skills and forming fast tracks into the right profession so that they can use their profession in our country. Because those who come to Sweden now, they are, they are young people. A majority is under 30. And they are the missing uh, jigsaw um, thing. Puzzle, to, yeah. Puzzle, yeah, for, for the demographic challenge because we really need these people in the labor market. We have economic growth between 3 and 4% in Sweden each year, and we have... An aging population. An aging population, so we are lacking skilled people in a lot of areas. And young people come here, they are not skilled yet, but we can skill them uh, and train them. So this is, of course, uh, very important. The state is important, but also, of course, uh, social partners, initiatives from uh, employers, uh, we have a lot of good, good employers that take initiatives and civil society, that's, that's very important. Questions? Right here. Yep. Please identify yourself. I'm Robin Bowles, I'm Chief Executive of InKind Direct and we've looked into starting up in Sweden. We distribute manufacturers con consumer products to charities. And in both the US and the UK, there's, there's a culture of individual philanthropy. And I found it really interesting when you started out saying that 93% of the population wanted you to help refugees. And I just wondered, would it be the same if, if people, people think that's the responsibility of the government? Whereas in the US and the UK, there's so much more of a culture of individual philanthropy. Would there be that same support if people, didn't, if people thought it was gonna fall on their own 
on their own hands, not not on the government's hands. And by the way, I, should, I would add to that that I, I, is, doesn't it cost you 2% of GDP, the refugee crisis I read, which would be in the US, I think $180 billion of government spending, but yeah. A, yeah. That, that could be correct. Uh, it's a lot of money. Well, it, of course it's difficult to answer your question, but in Sweden people like to pay taxes. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, it's, it's very unpopular to say we should lower the taxes and we should do it another way. So people say, well, we, we must have quite high taxes so we can afford to do things also for refugees. Uh, but that doesn't um, exclude a lot of people are doing things voluntarily, very much. Uh, with this, uh, this is huge. Uh, uh, what, what, we had this what about companies too? Yeah, companies are also th doing things, but especially, I would say, it's the uh, civil society. And when we had this crisis in the fall of 2015, uh, there was a, a spontaneous uh, movement, welcome refugees, that just stand there on the railway stations. Uh, people, uh, doctors, for example, after work, they came there, uh, worked voluntarily. A lot of people just stay there and work voluntarily to help people, to help them find some place to stay, to help them with health care, to help them with whatever. So there is a strong, um, there is a strong, uh, in Swedish society, a strong will to do things voluntarily, but we usually do not pay so much voluntarily, we pay taxes. And your top tax rate being? Uh, how much we pay? Yeah, what's the top tax rate in, in Sweden? For, for the highest yeah. uh, tax? Uh, I don't, well, the average is um, just 48, 49%. Um, Questions? Right here. Thank you so much. Uh, we also experienced in Italy, um, and I personally touched the, the crucial importance you of this. Remind us your title. Oh, oh sorry, you. Stefania yes. uh, Giannini. Yes, I'm former Minister of Education, Higher Education and Universities in the Renzi government. And uh, I, I do believe and, um, that migration is not uh, simply a very important issue, it's the issue we have in Europe. And you know, uh, Italy is a British country, so uh, it's quite, uh, um, uh, it's facing more and more this, uh, this issue uh, the year uh, after year. Uh, we recently approved a law, a new law, which tried to combine the three dimension, uh, which was the most important ones, uh, referring to this question, uh, security, hospitality, integration, and security, and I think it did. Uh, but my question uh, to, uh, to Minister of Sweden and to Hilva is the following. You, you talk about the role, the key role of education, I think, not simply because you already been in charge for that, but because if you, if you don't have the right to, to uh, integrate by means of language learning, by means of uh, a real process of uh, uh, school integration, it's really difficult to have, it. So, so for minors and also for adults, uh, a very well integrated society. In Italy, uh, we concentrated uh, the last three years about language learning uh, for uh, migrants and for uh, children who are in the school. Uh, we also have a very high percentage now it's around 10% of, uh, uh, in, as a average, and in some, in some uh, particular uh, places we have also 30% or 40% in a class where teachers have to learn uh, with the different multicultural and multilanguages uh, children every day without having the right preparation, the right training in the, in the background. So we, we try to concentrate uh, especially on this topic because language is not simple simply uh, uh, the way, uh, the, 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 the most uh, uh, important way of communication, uh, but it's also uh, the, the, the most uh, important uh, uh, way to, to, to understand uh, the point of view of this society and to, to be integrated. What did you do about that? Language, uh, in, uh, in, in Sweden, do, do you concentrate on the same topic or do you believe that is something uh, which is a, uh, uh, with uh, an accessory role, thank you. Did you focus on language? Yes, we do, and we are performing quite well in language. We have a long tradition of, of teaching our Swedish language to newcomers. You know, 20% approximately of our population is born outside Sweden, so we are a multicultural country. But 
the, the challenges we are facing in education, to be more specific, of course, language is always a challenge, but uh, to be more specific, uh, we have a lot of people that come here as teenagers or 20, 25, 27 years old, and they can't go through the whole educational system if they arrive in Sweden with a very low level. And we have quite a high, the, the lowest level of education in Sweden is quite high. Right. So that's a, a, a problem coming into the labor market. And we do not have a good tradition of vocational training uh, at the workplace. Uh, for example, they have in, in Germany or, or Denmark. We don't have that tradition in Sweden. So we have to find that. We have to find new paths for people not going through the whole educational system, but to pick some part of it and to be able to build a knowledge enough and training and skilled uh, vocational training enough to have their first job. And a well-paying job. Yes. And, something and this, is, we, we are not, this is not what we are uh, good at. Yeah. Uh, so this is what we are struggling with to, to form. And also to help children in school, uh, because some of them, they need some extra support in their mother tongue. Because otherwise, uh, for example, in math, I mean, it's too much Swedish in math. <laughs> if you have a support in the mother tongue, then you can concentrate on the math skills. So this is also what we are lacking, uh, strategies to help them to use their mother tongue to uh, make progress in some uh, subjects and also parallel to make progress in, in Swedish. Well, Ilva, I think uh, people around the world are gonna be watching you uh, yeah. and your, uh, your generous uh, sensibility towards the refugees and we wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us.